more on Facebook. Just give me a moment to get my reader on board. Get my reader on board real quick. Pardon me. Alrighty. Success. Peace. Peace, brother. Is there like a delay when I talk? No. Okay. Alright. Well, hello, Facebook. My name is Cephas My my reader, Chris Hudson. Beautiful Sunday morning, but it's nothing like the Sabbath. And um, coming to you today with the topic of this week, which is the division that comes with Christ. The reason why I say that is because now when you look at the world, you have countless religions. You got, you know, Buddhism, you've got Confucianism, you've got Islam. Those are your, you know, your major ones. But then you have Christianity. And within Christianity, even then, even there, it has its division. But the true division comes when you begin to live the Bible as a lifestyle rather than just word of mouth. And what I mean by that is majority of people, when you ask them what, what, what faith they are, they say, oh, you know, I'm a Christian. But that's just what they identify as, right? Like, that's just what they readily identify as. But for a very few in number, for a very few in number, it's not the case. This is actually a lifestyle. The one thing I want to read to you, because this is where that division comes. And this is one of my favorite verses. I read this all the time, but it's Proverbs Chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, and 1 verse, verse 23. And it reads, it reads, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproof of instruction are the way of life. Because for us, this isn't, you know, something we just talk about. We don't just go to church on Sunday to get amped up over, you know, uh, what's it called, you know, Prayer and, well, prayer is good, but over, like, you know, choirs and things like that. We, we get into this word of God and we study it. But not everybody does that. So, it's out of the class called The Division That Comes With Christ. And Jesus, when he came here, he's gonna say, we're going to read it out of his own mouth, what, what he came to say. And that's going to be our opening scripture, Matthew chapter 10. And we're going to pick it up at verse 34. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34. I'll give y'all a second to flip over there. Whoever's tuning in. Matthew chapter 10. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. All right. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. When you get there, go ahead and read. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. Think about that. Jesus said, think not that I'm come to bring peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Of course, with Jesus, there is peace. But however, when it comes to Jesus, he lived without sin. Therefore, he upheld the law. Not everybody wanted to do that. And he's calling out of the world the real Christians, the Bible Christians. And that's where that sword comes for you to follow the ways of Christ and not the ways of the world. What else does he say? For I am come to set a man a variance against his father and a daughter against her mother and a da daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So, you know, 
I'm not worried about a man in Japan, how he feels about the way I worship Christ, nor in Africa or anywhere else. But in the simple fact that in my house or anybody, there may possibly be division simply because you worship the word of God according to the T, according to the law, statutes, and commandments, which was given to Israel, God's chosen people. Not everybody wants to submit themselves to the righteousness of God because they live according to the flesh. That's Romans chapter 8. So he says, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father. Because there may be a division there. How your parents look at you for how you worship Christ. And then on the other side, he says, and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Somewhere down the other, someone is going to feel some form of tension either between family members, you know, school, work, regardless of where you go, just because of the way you believe, there's going to be variance, tension, strife, whatever you want to call it. Verse 36. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. You don't got to go really far at all to find some form of tension, like I said. It'll be in your own household. Especially, for example, you got to keep the dietary law. And, you know, your family always love eating those pork ribs. But then for you to say, nah, I'm going to put that down because the Lord told me I have to be holy like he is holy. That's Leviticus 11. He says, thou shalt not, you know, eat so-and-so. And that includes the swine. That includes the catfish, the, the shrimp, and so forth. But just for your own eating habits that you're giving up, but are renowned in your family because you want to change your eating habits, that can cause issues. For the fact that, you know, everybody in your family wants to go to church on Sunday, but you know you are to keep the Sabbath. Why? Because that is a sign between God and his people. He says that in Exodus 31. But simple fact that you're following God in worship and in truth and that's what the Lord requires of you, which we're going to read. Because you want to worship in spirit and in truth, it's going to cause variance. And he says, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. So you don't have to get much, you don't got to go out the door without finding some form of tension. Fortunately, there are some families that are on one accord, but many aren't. We're going to read that the there's very few on this path of righteousness, this path to life. Keep going, though. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Read that one more and time. He that loveth son or daughter. Read that one more time. He that loveth father. Okay. He that loveth father or mother more than me, he is not worthy of me. You see that it says, he, he that, that loveth, loveth mother or father more than me. Now, you can, you can finish that verse up, brother. Sorry. It's all good. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So in, in one way, if you were this if you were the father and you were and you began seeking the Lord and you had children who you didn't grow up, you didn't raise them to keep the law, statutes, and commandments. You know, idealistically you'd go your own way and they'd look at you weird. But it, I understand the, the point of view from where you are the child. And your parents don't want to, you know, especially when you live under their roof. They don't want, they, they have some form of way against you because of the way you believe now. But either way, he's telling you, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Does that sound like the Jesus that's preached on Sunday morning that loves everybody? You know, he just wants blessings to be pouring out on everybody. You can do whatever you want. No. Jesus is telling you, listen, you put me before everything else. Nothing can be before me. Not your mother, not your father. And I, in, in reality, if, any, if anybody could worship God however they wanted to, there'd be no issue with putting God before them. But God is telling you, no, I have a standard. You have to come at me a certain way. And if anybody ha feels some type of way towards you for doing that, you have to forsake them before you forsake me. Because ultimately, 
If you forsake God for others, he will also forsake you. So you can't put anybody above him. He says, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He ain't going to invest his time in you. You can pray on it, call on him all you want. He ain't hearing your prayers. He don't want nothing to do with you if you can put others before him. And then he goes by saying, he that loveth son or daughter more than me, that is more than me, is not worthy of me. Like, no matter what, you can't put anybody, your friends, family, your job, nothing can be more important than the Lord. Keep going. He that loveth father or more than he that loveth. Verse 38. Th verse 38. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. He that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And this is a burden when he when he's talking about Christ. He's talking about the burden that you have to carry when it comes to worshiping Christ. Because it's a different life that you follow, that you walk now. Because the majority of the world don't know of this walk. We're learning that the majority of this world is on the path to destruction. But you taking on this burden, carrying your own personal cross, you're taking that, that narrow path onto life. He says, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. So if you can't bear this burden, don't expect to find everlasting life. Because Jesus had to bear his own cross. He had to bear his burdens. He had to live blameless so he could die for the sins of the world. So who are you to think that you can, you know, take things lightly? You can't. Whatever comes your way, you have to bear with it, just like he did. Verse 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Right. But that's that's the best part about it. Yeah, it's a it's a burden we have to carry. Yeah, it's a it's a hard life, the division, which we're gonna read about. Because it's always existed. We have it now. You've always had to divide, separate yourself from the wickedness of the world. Cause even these Sunday Christians keeping the same traditions of people who don't follow Christ, they're all on one accord. And they're all on the path to destruction. Like I said, we're going to read that. But if you forsake all that and seek Christ, you, bury, you carry that burden to worship Christ in spirit and in truth. You lose that life and you gain life. Because it says, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. You're losing this past life, and the Lord will reward you with everlasting life. You'll be in the kingdom. But turn over to our next scripture. We're going to pick it up at John chapter 4. Because the worship of God in spirit and in truth, this is not a new concept. One, we got to realize it's not a new concept. Two, it is required of us. John chapter 4. We're going to pick it up at verse 22, actually. John chapter 4 and verse 22. When you get there, go ahead and read. 21, I'm sorry, verse 21. All right. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Now, he is he worshiping this lady who was basically, they're going back and forth. He asked for some water to drink. And, you know, she didn't. But, the fact, but on another note, Jesus said, if you asked of me, I could have given you living waters. But then the lady decided to build her report about how her forefathers and so forth had worshipped God. So then Jesus goes in response with saying, woman, believe me. Check this out. The hour cometh when you shall neither worship you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Why? Verse 22. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. That's what Jesus said there. He says, ye know, ye know, he said, ye worship, ye know not what. And that's what's going on for the majority in this world. They don't really know what they worship. They, they just, they go by tradition. Or by word of mouth. Whatever sounds good to them, they just assume is true and believe it. But 
they have yet to open their book and read the facts. That's why he says, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So evidently, you have to know something. And not just anything, but what the truth is. Because not everything, evidently, is accepted. Because he's telling her, you don't know what we wor you worship. I know what I worship. So hers is put, her form of worship is put on the back burner. But the way Jesus worships, obviously, is going to be accepted. Verse 22. Verse 23, I'm sorry. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the, the Father seeketh such to worship him. Right. And that's, that's, that's what Jesus is trying to get us to realize. That's how we have to worship God, in spirit and in truth. Because God is truth. There's no lies that can dwell with him. There's no wickedness that can deal, dwell with him. So how can we, you know, worship God with traditions that are founded on lies? He says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It's a, it's the, did it say and they that worship can worship him in spirit and in truth? Or if they want to worship him in spirit and in truth, you know, they don't must. have to worship him in spirit and in truth. No, it says they must worship him in spirit and in truth. This isn't a request. This isn't him mm -hmm. making a plea to you. Please worship me in spirit and in truth. Please worship me according to the way I have instructed you. No, he's telling you you have to. And if you don't, it's in vain. Anything less of that is unprofitable to you. And that's where that division lies because everybody wants to do their own thing instead of submitting themselves to the law of God, to the true form of worship. Now turn over to Joshua chapter, Joshua chapter 24 because this isn't a new concept. This has always been required of Jesus' saints, of God's followers. This has always been required of us. Isn't this isn't anything new? You've got God all over this Bible, and if you read, you'll realize that majority of the time people want to do their own thing and not worship God. Why do you think Noah, only him and his sons and their wives were saved when the flood came? Because people want to do their own thing instead of worship God. But this is that division that comes to Christ. You can't partake in all the traditions of the world. Them, them Christmas gifts, hey, I'll pass. You want to give me a gift? My birthday's in September. September 14th. Keep note of that. If not, I don't need it on Christmas. All right? I'm good. I don't need anything on New Year's unless it's in April when the new New Year's is, is here. Not January acknowledging the false god. But J J uh, Joshua chapter 24 we're going to pick it up at verse 14. When you get there, go ahead and read. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. In what? And put away the gods which your father. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. We just read in John chapter 4 that you had to worship him in spirit and in truth. Where, you know, where do you think he got this from? We're talking about we're, we're, we're going along the same lines here, precept upon precept. To realize that this isn't anything new. He says, now therefore, fear the Lord. Because if you're going to fear God, you're going to obey him. So he says, now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him and in, Him in sincerity and in truth. Not however you want to, but according to knowledge. Keep going. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Right. It says, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. You have to put aside the, this idolatry that we got going on in the Sunday Christian church. Because you can't, because that, that won't work here. You got to put away what is considered unclean in your household. You know, if you're going to worship the Lord, he gave you the Passover that acknowledges his death. So what business do you have acknowledging a birth that you have no record of? 
Now it says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. Bear in mind that this is letting you know other form of worship is out there. If you want to go for it, go for it. But if you're going to worship the Lord, you got to forsake him. Verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will, you got, you will you serve. Gotta, you got to pick a side. It's always been this way. We're going to read the same thing in the New Testament. It says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. If you don't, if 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 you don't feel like worshiping Christ in spirit and in truth, okay. That's between you and the Lord. If that's what you want to do, hey, that's that's not my decision to make. I know my decision. I'm going to do so. But it says, if it seem evil unto you, if you, if you ain't really feeling it that way, like that, or you know, we we look crazy because you know we don't we don't shave our beards. Like, like we look crazy because of that. We we look like a cult because y'all want to go to church on Sunday, but we keep the Sabbath, which is which is what you can read. Or you, we don't want to keep Christmas, but we keep the feast days, which is what you can read. We look crazy. Go ahead, do you pick a side though? Go ahead. Whether the guys which your father served that were on the other side of the flood. Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Right. Because guess what? If you don't want to do it, that's cool. At the end of the day, I'm going to keep this service. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 says, you know, you got to work out your salvation with the fear and trembling. I'm working on my salvation. What you do, I'm not accountable for. I'm going to tell you you're doing wrong, but after that, that's on you. But as for me, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So you pick a side, verse 16. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. Right. For the Lord our God. Let's get on that, let's get on that. But it says, and the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, because you can't do both. So, however your parents feel, because they may not be gods, but however your parents feel about you worshiping God in the truth, hey, I'd rather be living in the kingdom than burning for the fact of how they felt about me. Because if you don't want to worship God, there's only one end of result for you. So you have to bear that cross. And he told you, if you don't want to bear that cross, you're not worthy of him. You deny me in front of your friend, I'm going to deny you in front of the father. It's really as simple as that. And he says, it said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Because who would, anyone in their right mind would not want to do that. But let's go, let's keep going. Because this, this is a quick, short class. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to pick it up at verse 14. I done completely passed. Second Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to pick it up at verse 14. And when you get there, you can go ahead and read. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteous with unrighteousness? Go ahead. And what communion hath light with darkness? Right. Jesus is our light in reality. He is the light. He's that true light that shineth every man that cometh into the world. That's John chapter 1. But he's telling you, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know, if I'm a Christian, when Ramadan come along, you do not see me fasting during the day so I can eat at night. That I don't do that. Nor if I have understanding, if I have understanding, am I going to marry a woman that does not believe in the same God I believe? That's only going to create problems in the house. 
Because I'm picking my side. And God is telling you, you can't, you can't, not saying you can't love your neighbor because you have to do that, but at the same time, you don't partake in their evil deeds. It says, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? Because that's what it is. We are the children of light. And anyone uh, that is not in the light, evidently, just by default, is in darkness. Keep going. And what concord have Christ with Bilal? Right. Or what part have he have believed with the infidel? Right. So it says, and what concord have Christ with Belial? So what... What, you know, there's not going to be any form of relationship with God, the true and living God, and these false gods that people make up in their imaginations. They're not homies. One isn't even alive. It's fake. But you have the true and living God, so why would, if, if we're wrong for partaking in these false gods, you know Jesus, he, he ain't even considering it. He hates the idea of these false gods, that man is so wise in their eyes that they want to go and worship these false gods. So he's telling you, what concord has Christ with Belial? Like, that's nothing to him. So he has, so he's not even giving it a thought. But at the same time, it says, or oh, what part hath the, that he, have he that believeth with an infidel? And an infidel is someone who doesn't believe. That's what an infidel is. They don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. They don't believe in Christianity and all that. So what if you're a believer, what business do you have with an atheist? Y'all ain't not going to be on one accord. And the name is, chapter 3, it says, you know, two cannot walk unless they agree, you know, late in turns. So you have to be on accord somewhere. But if you're in the truth and they're not, there is no way you can be on one accord. Because they're your beliefs are conflicting with each other right off the bat. Keep going. In what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Right. So if God is within us, spiritually talking now, because we walk in his path, you know, in Second John chapter, you know, First John chapter 2, it says that we... Keep his commandments, we know him. And if you keep it, if you don't keep his commandments and say you know him, you're a liar. But at the same time, when you keep the commandments, that shows that he is in us, that we're walking his ways and he is in us. So it says, And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, because he dwells within us. And it says, God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So if we are God's people, we have no business with idols. We have no business kissing the St. Mary statue, which is a false idol. We have no business, you know, when you go into Catholic Church, you see all these different statues that they give the name of apostles and disciples. But really, they were pagan gods that were worshipped in the past. But they were indoctrinated. It don't matter what name you give it, it's still idolatry. No matter what you do, you cannot justify wearing a cross necklace. It's all idolatry. You have no business with that. We keep going. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Be ye what? Saith the Lord. Be ye separate. Right. It says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. God is always telling you, you have to divide yourself from the wickedness. You have to divide yourself from the rest of the world because they want to deal with idols. If you're gay, you can hang out with a straight person, and you know they 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 think the same. Like like it's okay to be gay even though they can't you know repopulate, but it's okay. With that makes no sense. But the world is on one accord. Us Christians who are in the truth. We don't think like that. It says, and because of that, that's why it says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And what else? And touch not the unclean. 
and I will receive you. Right. So, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. But if you want to dwell in the unclean things, he will not receive you. Be mindful of that. You have to touch not the clean things, and then he will receive you. You have to realize within yourself that you want to be separated from this evil doing in this world. And then he will receive you. Is that on that verse 18? And will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Right. So, separate yourselves. Partake in this division that comes with Christ. Because he didn't come to send peace but a sword. It don't matter about your family situation, financial situation, whatever. What, what really matters is do you trust and believe in God? Because if you do, he's your provider. He'll make a way for me, for you. And, and, and ultimately, if you need to be separated from people, he will do it in order for you to worship him. In sincerity and in truth. In spirit and in truth. According to his laws, statutes, and commandments. So turn over to Matthew chapter 12. Because Jesus had the same mentality. Jesus had the same mentality. We're not crazy for reading it now. Jesus felt the same exact way. We have to separate ourselves from the people of the world and remain amongst the true worshipers of Christ and be one with them. Matthew chapter 12 and pick it up at verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. All right, so that's what's going then on. Then one said, so, then one said unto him. Jesus was, Jesus was, you know, doing his thing, talking, preaching, so forth. And it says, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. And they know what he's doing. Jesus is busy doing the Lord's work. Doing his thing right now. And his his mother and his brethren want to come up to interrupt that just to have a few words with him. Verse 47. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. Go ahead. But he answered and said unto him, that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? Right. Jesus was like, Who is my mother? Who is my brethren? Of course he has a mother, and he has real physical brothers. So, you know, just a little disclaimer, Mary didn't stay a virgin. She had other kids other than Jesus. He had physical brothers. But he says, who is my mother and who are my brethren? Something physical now. Verse 49. He that, he that stretched forth his hand towards his disciples, and he said, Behold, my mother and my brother. And then he brought it to something Whoa. spiritual. He took something physical and brought it to something spiritual. He said, he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, these are my mother. This is my brother. These are my family right here. Why? Verse 50. For whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother. And sister and mother. Because once God separates you, he's going to put you amongst other people who are going to worship God the way that he wants to be worshipped. And because of that, they're your new family. It's okay if he separates you from them. Because if you lose that life, you will find life. You lose this life to get a new one with a new family that you didn't pick. Because you didn't pick your last one. But now, you didn't pick this new one. But it's a better life. It's a greater family because now you're all on one accord. You're working together as the body of Christ to worship God. Now, we got to realize there are benefits to dividing yourself from the nonsense of this world. From the people who want to deal wickedly with one another. Because there's a great feeling when I can go to church and I know, you know, there's no one lusting after my wife. There's a great feeling when I can go to church when I can forget my Bible, or if I had a wife, she left her bag, that no one's going to go on her stuff and try to steal anything. You know, no one's going to lie to me. 
No one's trying to, you know, use me for my money, which is what these Sunday preachers do, saying that the law is done away with what they tithe. But like I'm saying, there's a great feeling to do that. But you won't get that in your regular churches. That only will, will happen if you worship God in spirit and in truth, and everybody is on one accord. I remember when I was at FS, my this church when I when I used to go to my old church, you know, I left you left the phone, gone. You left the charger, gone. Man. You left the Bible, Man. gone. You left the church. <laughs> like anything you left, that thing was gone. It would get stolen straight up. But they go into Man. church, acting holy, thinking they're doing the Lord's work, having a powerful praise team. But behind doors, behind closed doors, they're doing all kinds of wickedness. But you need to separate from those people who want to talk the talk but don't want to walk the walk. Because just like Jesus said, and he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother, and sister and mother. The people who are on one accord spiritually, that's your real family. Brother Chris, that's my brother right there. I got physical brothers who aren't on one accord with the Lord, but guess what? This brother right here, that's my brother. Let's go to our next scripture, John chapter 17. John chapter 17, we're going to pick it up at verse 6. Jesus, Jesus just now, you know, he's building, he's talking to the, he's calling on the Father right now, you know. And then one of the scriptures, he says, um, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. That's the little background information. Then we're picking up at that verse 6, though. Because Jesus is saying something key here right now. Verse 6, when you get that going, ahead and read. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were. And thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So, Jesus and the Father, they're on one accord. This is the relationship they have. Because the Father sent the Son to die for our sins. And he gave him instructions. And the Lord and Jesus had fulfilled them. And now he's saying, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. And, you know, it's Jesus, the name of Jesus. Because that's the name we're going to be saved by. It says, thine day... Thine they were, because we belong to the Father, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Because if you have the Son, you also have the Father. You can't deny the Son. You can't get to the Father without getting through the Son. And in verse 7. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So, you know, we're getting this word. Keep going. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Right, because we can see the Father when we see Christ. You know, the one who sent Christ was the Father. We don't need to physically see the Father because when we see Jesus, we see him. And when Jesus, when he was sent, now we got this word. And we walk in this word, guess what? Now we are in Christ. Because he is the word. He gave us the word and now that we walk in it, we're on one accord with Christ and being one accord with Christ, now we're on one accord with the Father. That's that's the unity we have going on here. But verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. What? But for them which thou hast given me. Say that again. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Right. He says, but for I them pray that which has given me. I pray not for the world. Now, people are so re ready to go to John chapter 3 and verse 16, where it says, you know, for God so loved the world, he sent his only son, you know, for the world. But Jesus is telling you right now, I pray for the people that you gave me. I don't pray for the world. 
Why? Because James chapter 4 tells you that if you are friends with the world, you are in enmity with God. Because you can't be on accord with the world thinking that you worship Christ. You can't. Because the world hates God. The world does not want to listen to anything God has to say. They're legalizing transgender restrooms in elementary schools and middle schools. Like These children don't even have the decision. They can't even make the decision themselves whether or not they want to work, love someone of the opposite gender. You got parents making it for them. That's how wicked the world is right now. They want to make it okay to have this sexual or immorality taking place. That's just one example. So he says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Because Jesus got nothing to do with this world. The God of this world is Satan. And the world don't belong to Christ until his second coming. And he, and he destroyed this world and, re, and rebuild it himself. But he says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. He's only concerned about the ones who are worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Because that's how he knows that they are his. That's who he's concerned about. He ain't worried about the world. It's doing his own wicked doings. Verse 10. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. Go ahead. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep thy own keep keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Right. Cause we still in this world, we can't get out of it. We gotta sit here and deal with the burdens. We got to deal with the persecution. We got to be mocked. We got to be made fun of. For no reason. All because yeah. we keep what is, keep which is what does say the Lord. God said to do this. Okay, I'm going to do it. But because we do it, we're, we're, we're mocked at. Which is crazy. And it says, and now I am no more in the world because Jesus is gone now. But these are in the world and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those Thou hast given me that they may be one as we are one. And just like Jesus, the Son, and the Father on one accord, like now, Chris, my brother, spiritually, and those who are worshiping God in spirit and truth, we are all one. We are the true body of Christ. Not these different religions or, you know, denominations. Like when someone says they're, when someone says they're a Christian, there shouldn't be that following up question, what denomination are you? Why? Because we're supposed to be one. We should all have the same understanding. That's why it's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. But because we all want to do our own thing, there's all this division. But the true division comes when you worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and separate yourselves from all these denominations. All this false worship. Do what you want. I do what I want. We both get to heaven. That's three lies. Right there. You got to separate yourselves and seek the Lord diligently. Let's turn over to our next scripture, though. Psalms chapter 97. This is a good thing. Even though it comes with some form of burden, it's still a good thing. Because it don't matter how the world sees us or how man sees us. All that matters is how God sees us. Because the world isn't going to give us everlasting life. The only one you're going to get it from is the Father through Jesus, the Son. Not how, not from the world. So who cares what they say? Psalm chapter 97. I'm going to pick it up. We're going to read one verse here. Verse 10. Psalms chapter 97 and verse 10. When you get there, go ahead and read, please. Yet that love, ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Love evil. Hate evil. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Just like in Psalms, it's like, if you're going to, if you're going to love the Lord, you got to forsake every, you have to hate every false way. You got to forsake these hate ways. You got to hate evil. Hold on, I'm going to turn over somewhere real quick. You don't got to read this. I'm going to just read it real quick. 
Job chapter 1. I'm going to read one thing real quick. Just one verse. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So, this guy was, this person was considered perfect in the eyes of God, and he says that this man was upright and one that feared God. And if you fear God, you're going to obey him. And Elijah said, and eschewed evil. He hated evil. Any form of evil that came away, he rebuked it. So, chapter 97 of Psalms, verse 10, it says, Ye that love the Lord, you gotta hate evil. You have to. If someone's got some wrongdoing going on, you're not a partaker of that. You separate yourself and come out of it. That's when the Lord receives you. Keep going. He preserved the souls of his saints. He delivered them out of the hand of the wicked. Out of the hand of the wicked. Because they don't like you now. Oh, you ain't doing Christmas? You don't acknowledge New Year's? You know what I'm saying? You don't keep Easter? Like, the false God's name is even in the name of the holiday. Easter. Man. You don't want to keep these false idols traditions? How dare you? Like, I remember I was talking to someone around Christmas last year. He said, Merry Christmas. And I said, I don't celebrate Christmas. And I wouldn't say it back. He said, that's messed up, man. That's what he said to me. He said, that's messed up. I said, why? He said, because, you know, it would make me happy for you to say it back, but you won't say it back. But in my mind, it's just like, so it's a, so I have to dishonor my God, which is Jesus, who you claim to worship. I have to dishonor him to make you happy. That's foolish. I ain't got no time. I'm not going to ever do that. But it says he delivered them out of the hand of the wicked. Because if they look at, they, they persecute you verbally, sometimes physically, just because what you believe. But the Lord is there. He's going to preserve the souls of his saints. He delivered them out of the hand of the wicked. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. Forget about verse 34. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 34. When you get there, go ahead and read, please. Blessed is the man that heareth me. Watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. Right. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. Like we're diligently seeking the Lord. Like, like when, like on Black Friday, right? And people just lining up at the doors at Walmart, just waiting for them to open the door so you can get in and grab. That's how we should be seeking the Lord. Exactly. He says, "Blessed is the man that heareth me." Watching daily at my gates. Like, you're just waiting for him to just let you in. If you don't, and we don't have any form of, you know, intensity like that for Christ. No one has that zeal for Christ anymore. They think, you know, God has to do whatever they say. When in reality, we got to do what God says. They're looking for a God that serves them. And they don't realize that they're the servant. You're the clay. He's the potter. You do what he says. Verse 35. For whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Right. And that's why we need to be diligently seeking him. Because in reality, we're diligently seeking life. It's like no one cares for life anymore. We're all spiritually dead, and that's how we want to end up physically. We don't care about life. We don't care about our own lives. I was talking to Chris earlier, like, oh, yesterday, like, thrill to us now is staring danger or death at, at the face and then escaping it just by, you know, merely escaping. Like, why is that a thrill? Why is that exciting to us? We're not seeking life, but he says, whoso findeth life and shall obtain, fa and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Whoso, whoso findeth me findeth life. 
So, you know, let me read that through again. It says, Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my door. So, like on Black Friday, like I said before, you know, when you see that massive sale on that 60 inch TV, think about life right before your eyes. You need to be seeking that because it's not going to be dropped in your lap. When we die, we don't all go to heaven. That's a lie. So we need to be diligently seeking this life. We're waiting, watching at the door, at his gates. Verse 36. But he that sinneth against me, wrong of his own soul, and all they that hate me love death. Right. And this world hates God. They seeking death. People are like, man, I guess I'm a burn in hell then. You know? Because I tell them, you know, you, you got no business eating pork. You know, you got to keep the Sabbath. Oh, man, I guess I'm just burning hell then. Like, really? Do you not realize how extreme that statement is? <laughs> G Jesus said, if your eye offend you, pluck it out. You know, it's better you get into the kingdom without an eye than you'll be burning in the lake of fire forever where the worms die not. Well, people make it such a light thing. But that's because they don't understand. There's that division right there. When you're in the world, you're living in darkness. You don't know how serious this walk is. And you have to separate yourself from these people who don't care. Instead, you need to be diligently seeking the Lord. Because if you find him, you find life. You're not going to find it in this world. But he says, he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. Like, you should feel bad. When you know better and you still do bad. But instead, these people know they ain't supposed to be, you know, killing. They know they ain't supposed to be lying, but they do it to their kids every December 25th. They know they ain't supposed to be, you know, sleeping around. I mean, I've talked to people about the Bible. And they said, no, nah, I don't want to read it because it's telling me something that I'm not supposed to do. And I'm already doing it. But he's saying here, he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. If you don't want to deal with God, guess what? That's what you're looking for. You want death. But let's turn over to Revelation chapter 22 because there's, there's great things that come with walking in this walk. Peace, Brother Yusuf. I didn't even know we were praying. <laughs> Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. We get there, we're going to read two verses here. This is, blessed is the man who seek the Lord, right? Well, this is a person who seeks the Lord. Revelation chapter two, 22. We're going to pick it up by verse 14. We get there, go ahead and read, please. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. And may enter through the gates into the city. Right. It says, blessed are they that do his commandments. It wasn't blessed are they who do car washes every Sunday. You know what I'm saying? It didn't say blessed are they who feed the homeless, which is a good thing, but that's not what it takes. That's not, that's not all it takes to get into the kingdom. Lord was seeking, was looking for those who would obey his, his words, his law, his statutes and commandments. Because that's the simplicity in Christ. Because your law teaches you how to love. But we don't have no love anymore. Everybody hates. They want to do wickedly towards one another. So instead, it says, blessed are they that do his commandments. Get the basics down. Get some understanding. Because really, that's what's preparing you to get into the kingdom. It's showing you how to operate as gods. Because Jesus... The Father and the Son, they don't lie to one another. They don't steal from one another. They honor one another. You know, they put one before the other. They're on one accord. The world is not. Even these families, they are not on one accord. Everybody think it's cool to have a side chick. You know, be unfaithful. To be deceitful. But instead, he says, blessed are they that do his commandments, because if you're keeping the commandments, guess what? That they may have rights to the tree of life, and the tree of life is Jesus. 
and may enter through the enter in through the gates into the city. So if you are keeping these commandments, guess what? You may have right to the to Jesus, and you get to get into the kingdom. That's the reward for partaking in this division, separating yourself from the wickedness of the world. You know, being one with the brothers that have brothers and sisters that Jesus has picked out, walking in this life, enduring until the end. That's the reward. Cause we ain't we ain't looking for the for the fame and riches of this world. Guess what? When you in the kingdom, everybody in the lake of fire, they're gonna be suffering. You can look down at them. They'll be like, man, they're looking up at you. Yo, you made it in? Shoot, man, I should have listened. Everybody gonna know you then. Everybody gonna know God when He cracked the sky open and He's putting a whooping on the world for doing the wickedness that they did. Then when He sets it up. You are gonna have the chance to get up in his kingdom. Not the wicked, not the wicked, not the world. Verse 15. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So, you know, when it's talking about dogs, guess what? It's talking about them greedy preachers who tell you, hey, it's okay, all you got to tie, all you got to do is tie your money away, but guess what? The law is done away with. You don't got to do nothing. But in reality, if the law is done away with, why do you tithe? Because tithing comes from the law. They're deceiving you just to take your money from you. So if you're going to do one part of the law, guess what? You got to do it all. But it says, for without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers. So Whoremongers, guess what? You got whores too. There's, you got no business sleeping around. Pick someone, stick with them, get married, be fruitful, and multiply. But you got no business sleeping around with different people. Then it says, and murderers. I don't even got to explain that. And idolaters. So if you weren't that cross necklace, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that your pastor didn't inform you that that is idolatry. But you got to give it up. You know? Not only that, but these statues, these false holidays, these are all forms of idolatry because it's dedicated to gods who are not the true and living God, Jesus. And then it says, and whoso make, loveth and maketh a lie. You got to get that tongue under subjection. Lying, that's going to be a big problem because God, that's one of the seven things that he hates is a lying tongue. Let's turn over to our last scripture, Matthew chapter 7. Like I said, it's a quick, quick lesson. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to pick it up at verse 23. Because there's this division here. Jesus is going to tell you about this division right here. Verse 21, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. When you get there, go ahead and read. Now everyone that sitteth unto me, say, now everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Okay. So it says, Now everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now we're not talking about Muslims because they don't call on the name of Jesus. We're not talking about the Buddhists. Because they don't call on the name of Jesus. We're not talking about the atheists. Because even though they say, bless you or oh my God, when they panic, they don't call on the name of Jesus. We're talking about Christians right here. And he's saying, not nah, all of you Christians, you know, that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. What is the will of the Father? You keeping his word. You walking in the light. What is his light? His law. His commandments. That's his word. And he's saying, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So if you're not doing those things, just because you call on the name of the Lord, you are not going to get in. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Right. Because, you know, we think we're doing, you know, we establish our own righteousness, doing what we think is okay, 
but say we do it in the name of the Lord. You know, we dedicate that one day, December 25th, to give out gifts to everybody else. Like, think about Salvation Army right now. They could be out every single day ringing the bell trying to save up money to give it to the homeless. But instead, they come on this one, like, one time frame during December to collect money for the homeless. Why? Because that's the time that they're willing to, you know, people willing to give it the most money. It's a money scheme. Think about it. But, you know, some says, have we not prophesied in that name? And in that name cast out devils? And in that name done many wonderful works? Keep, keep, be mindful of that. These people think that they're doing the right thing because they go out and do what they think is right to worship God. And at the same time, they're calling out Lord, Lord. But verse 23, what's that say? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye, ye that work iniquity. And he's going to say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What is iniquity? Sin. What is sin? Breaking God's law. Breaking his commandments. Because you want to do what you wanted to do, but you didn't want to submit to his law. Guess what? He never knew you, and he's telling you, get away from me. Because if you haven't prepared yourself to no longer stealing, no longer lying, no longer committing adultery, you know, all these things, if you can't submit, if you can't honor your mother and thy father, your physical parents, what makes you think you're going to respect the heavenly father, the one you can't see? What makes you think you're going to be on one accord with these gods who are perfect? When you haven't taught yourself to be perfect, instead did what you thought was right. Because Isaiah chapter 55, he says, you got to forsake your ways. Because your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. Because you think something is right, God don't think it's right. You're not like him, and you won't be like him until you walk in his commandments, in his law. But he says, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Jump, jump back to verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Right. So it says, enter ye in at the straight gate. Straight gate, you know, that narrow path. Why? Because... The gate that is wide and broad, it says, For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. The Lord is telling you of this division right now. The majority of this world is on one accord with Satan and on their way to hell, to the lake of fire. So it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in there at verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Right. There's going to be few people who find life. There's going to be few people, excuse me, few people on this narrow pathway to life. There's going to be few people who find it. Those who divide themselves from the world from the traditions of Christianity and uphold the real, the what you can read, the feast days, the commandments, the dietary law. You know, we don't sacrifice animals anymore. Yes, we keep the law, but we don't sacrifice animals, animals anymore. Why? Because we believe that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, here's the patience of, patience of the saints. Here are they that Keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. So your faith is backed up by your works. But that's the division that comes with Christ. Are you going to walk in his ways? Or are you going to do whatever you want like the rest of the world does? I hope y'all got some understanding. Peace. Peace.